So in the history of humanity, and even in our recent history, there have been many famous trials. You know, some of you might remember, or at least if you read history, the great Nuremberg trial that tried all the Nazi leadership. Uh, those of you um, follow American news, in 1995, there was this big O.J. Simpson trial. He was a big footballer who was accused of murdering his wife. One, another trial that goes way back in history um, was um, the trial of... Uh, I'm forgetting his name now. Socrates, yes. Socrates' trial. And that was a very famous trial. And it's unique because it's very... Uh, it has striking similarities to Jesus' trial. So he, uh, Socrates' trial happened in the year 399, so about 400 years before Jesus. But I don't have time to get into that one. But you can Google Socrates' trial and you see the similarities because there are many uh, uh, kind of... He was also sentenced and uh, he was going to be sent out into the wilderness. And instead of doing that into exile, he drank poison and he died. Uh, again, very similar, uh, similar because he was going against the grain of what, was, what the current philosophies and teachings were, very much like Jesus. But the greatest trial of all time, and the one that has probably an incalculable impact on humanity, was the trial of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the trial that we're going to examine today. But not just examine because he's our Lord and Savior. We're going to follow it with a kind of reverence and meditation. And as we go through the trial of Jesus, we're going to try and understand what does this mean for ourselves? What do these characters mean? What do these words that were said, you know, there are dialogues, there's a lot of drama in Jesus' trial. But it's not a pure drama for entertainment because it's the drama of our lives as well. So as I help you do that, keep your heart open and listen carefully. And if you can, something might touch you there, not everything, but there might be a particular character or particular thing that was said really appeals to your heart, then take that with you and investigate that further. So to help you with this meditation, I want to first put up a map here, and that will help you sort of orient you. So before I go, it's like I'm giving you a tour, but first I'm going to give you the map of the tour. So we're going to, everything begins in the Mount of Olives. So that's uh, no, actually before that, then the upper room where they had the Last Supper, right? At the bottom, you see number one, that's the upper room. From the upper room, Jesus and his disciples proceeded all the way, if you follow that purple arrow uh, line, to the Garden of Gethsemane, also known as the Mount of Olives there. And from there, Jesus was arrested. And after his arrest, he was brought to number three and four. It says house of Caiaphas. But actually before that he was brought to the high priest Annas. And we'll talk about them a little more in detail later. And then to Caiaphas. They were both relatives. One was father-in-law and one was son-in-law. Both were high priest. And from the house of Caiaphas then, Jesus was taken to Pilate, which is number five up there. Okay, it says the um, Tower of Antonia. Now, there's a little debate whether Jesus was really taken to the Tower of Antonia or whether Pilate was actually in Herod's palace at the time. But it doesn't matter. But he was taken to Pilate. From Pilate, he was taken to Herod. 
Now that could have been depending on where he was in the same palace or maybe from the Tower of Antonia to Herod's temple, which is uh, number six over there. And from Herod's palace, he was taken back to Pilate. And there he received his last sentence. And from there, of course, the way of the cross. So we're not going to go through the whole way of the cross. Now, when these readings, the Passion readings are done on Passion Sunday and on Good Friday, most of us are too tired. If we will be honest with us, we are, you know, hungry from the fasting, we're tired from the standing, and most of it kind of just goes over our head. Okay, maybe we pick up on the crucifixion, we pick up on a few things, but the whole trial, you know, that was 2,000 years ago, you know, who cares about that? You know, just let just finish this off and let me sit. <laughs> That's, and, you know, once we sit, we're so relieved because this is not going to happen again for another year, right? Till the next Lent. So that is why I decided to take this particular topic so we can become a little more familiar. So when you go through that reading on Palm Sunday and on Good Friday, it'll be a little more meaningful for you. And that standing up for that reading will not be so painful, okay, because it'll have a little more meaning. So when Jesus was arrested, he was brought to the house of Annas. Now, Annas was a high priest, but was not the current high priest. He was high, the previous high priest. And he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the current high priest. So this, many people don't realize. You know, you just hear Annas, and he was Caiaphas, and, uh, and he, they were high priests, so you don't know which one is which. So Annas was the father-in-law, Caiaphas was the son-in-law. Annas actually had five sons, and maybe he had one daughter who was married to Caiaphas. And these sons were, uh, is believed to have had, and they were also priests. So when you're in the house of priests, you are all priests. Okay? So these sons apparently had tents in the temple. And they were part of that whole temple nonsense that was happening. All the buying and selling, they were involved. So you can imagine when Jesus drove them all the way, why there was so much anger among the high priest. Because it hit home. Because there were relatives of the high priest doing all of that. Can you imagine the parish priest here? And then maybe during, um, you know, Sundays, uh, there are all stalls and money-making racket going on. And they're all related to that priest. <laughs> Wouldn't that be an outrage? Um, so, at Annas, uh, Jesus was brought to Annas. And he started to question Jesus. It was more like an inquiry. It wasn't a trial as such. There was an inquiry. So he asked him, Jesus, two things. Who are your disciples? And what were you teaching? Now, Annas was not really interested in what Jesus taught. It's not that he was looking to learn from Jesus. He just wanted to know how big is his following. And was he teaching anything that's contradictory so they could trap him? The whole idea you have to understand that the high priests and the elders and the chiefs had already decided to kill Jesus. They had plotted. Right after he had raised Lazarus from the dead, they had decided, we want this man dead. Now they just needed an excuse. So Anna started to inquire of him. Okay? Tell us about your disciples and tell us about your teachings. And I don't know if you, any of you remember what Jesus said. Jesus did not answer. And there was a reason. See, so what do you have a, a Jewish when you um, there, There's two kinds of trials. Um, the chief priests and the council, the Sanhedrin, could try. But there was limits to what they could do and uh, what kind of uh, accusations and charges they could bring. And one thing that was important according to the Jewish law, there had to be a witness whenever you charge someone. So they were looking to see if Jesus would implicate himself. And Jesus knew this, so he wasn't going to make things easy for them. So Jesus did not respond to Annas. In fact, he did respond, but not directly. He said, I've been teaching openly in the temple, everywhere. Not just to the Jews, to everyone. 
So why do you ask me? Why don't you ask them? And he said it very politely. But because of that, because he did not answer the direct question, one of the guards slapped him. And that was the first violent act against Jesus that would just get worse after that point. So Annas was very frustrated. He could not get what he wanted. So he was sent to the house of Caiaphas. Say Caiaphas. Okay, these names uh, uh, should become familiar to us. By the way, Caiaphas is a Syriac name, but it means Cephas, which is the same as Peter. So his name was also Peter. Okay? So Cephas. But in Syriac, it's Caiaphas. So Caiaphas was the reigning high priest. Now what time was Jesus arrested? In the night. In the night. So now it's the night. And normally, you don't try have trials during the night. But there was a reason. The chief priests and the elders wanted to try Jesus and sentence him at night so that it happens quickly. And before the Sabbath and was the Passover feast, they didn't want to make a big deal out of it. So do it quickly. It was a rush trial. Okay? It was a rush trial. So they wanted to do it quickly. And they knew they were going to bring false charges against him. So everything was happening in the middle of the night in a rushed manner. So at Caiaphas's house gathered the council, the Sanhedrin. And they were all together and they, they were um, accusing him. Now, there were different accusations made against Jesus. One was that, you know, he... Um, that he's, uh, uh, so again, they're trying to look for witnesses. They know they cannot accuse him without witnesses. So they're trying to find witnesses, but nobody would come forward. Finally, some false witnesses came. And they said, this man said that he would destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. But he would destroy the temple. Did Jesus say that he would destroy the temple? He never said that. He said, destroy this temple. You destroy, not he would destroy. And he was referring to his body, which was the new temple. But they twist things and they say, he said, destroy the temple. And, uh, and then different other things. He said, don't pay, uh, tax it to Caesar. And all kinds of accusation. But they were contradicting each other. So there was a lot of confusion. So Caiaphas said, I cannot, this, this fish is slipping out of my hands. So he didn't know what to do. He was desperate. Finally, in his desperation, he took God's oath. He put Jesus under God's oath. Now this is very interesting. Okay? He's putting God under God's oath to defend God. Who's being defended here? God. And so, he says, I put you under the, by in God's name, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? And now here, Jesus is not hesitant. I have to remind you that throughout Jesus' ministry, he really hesitated as to who he would reveal his divinity to. Jesus was both human and divine. He was the son of man and he was the son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary but he also came from heaven and he had said do not throw pearls before pigs. So Jesus never spoke about his divinity to those who were not ready, to those who did not have faith but only to those who had faith, he would reveal himself. He knew very well that these men were not interested in the truth. They were not interested in knowing his divinity, that he was the son of God. They were not interested in salvation. They just wanted to kill him. But here was an important question. So he was not going to ignore him. And he knew that his hour had already come and he was now going to die. His work was finished, almost finished. But because he was asked, are you the son of God, Messiah, if he had kept quiet here, that would not be right at all. So he responds. He says, yes, I am. Remember that word? 
I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And when Moses went to the burning bush, and when God told him, you were going to go and free my people Israel from the Pharaoh, Moses asked, when they asked me, who sent you? In whose name you're coming? Who sent? What am I supposed to say? And what did God say? Tell them, I am sent you. So he responded, Jesus responded very prophetically so they would understand who really was. He said, I am. And he said further, further he said, and you will see the Son of Man. This is very significant. It's the Son of Man descending on the clouds. And when Jesus said this, he was quoting from Daniel. And he was quoting Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Daniel, I'll read this quickly. Daniel uh, chapter 7, verse 13 says... I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one. The ancient one is the father. Okay? God the father. And was presented before him. To him was given. To whom? To Jesus. To the son of man. Was given dominion and glory and kingship. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Now these chief priests who knew the Bible, they knew the Torah, they knew the law, they knew the prophets would have known what that son of man meant. So when he said yes to that question, Caiaphas was angry and outraged, and he tore his priestly robe. In those days, the priest, you, they, uh, you would tear your robes when you were really were in anger, in pain, or in sorrow. So the priest tore his robes. Remember the significance of that. Soon, when Jesus would die, the curtain of the temple would also be torn because of Jesus' death, because he would bring about the unity between man and God. We would now not be separated from God. We'd be able to approach him directly. So tearing of Caiaphas' robe out of his anger and outrage and sorrow uh, because he believed that Jesus had committed blasphemy. But it was not blasphemy. It was confession of who truly Jesus was. So he said, why do we need any witnesses? We don't need any witnesses. Can you not see? He has admitted himself that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. That's blasphemy, and that deserved death. We should put him to death. There was only one problem. We're still in three and four, right? There was one problem. Anybody know what was the problem? The Jews... The Sanhedrin, the council of the chief peace and the elders, could not put anyone to death because they were under Roman rule. Now, they had certain, um, a certain authority, but they did not have authority to put anyone to death. So, therefore, they take Jesus from there to Pilate. So Pilate was the governor. He was also known as the procurator. So his responsibility was to keep law and order and peace in this Roman, if you want to call it Roman province, a Roman colony. Rome was far away. His job was to keep peace. And he didn't want any trouble. And he had a relationship. Now, the chief priests, the Jews, did not like Pilate at all because of many, many things. They had a history of Lots of problems because he was very tough with them. He did many wrong things as well. So the chief priests certainly, um, uh, the high priests were not friends of Pilate. But yet the hatred for Jesus was so much, they were willing to go and deal with Pilate and appeal to him. So they took him to Pilate. And Pilate said, what accusations do you bring against this man? And they didn't have a specific answer at the point. He said, if he was not a criminal, we would not bring him to you. What kind of an answer is that? 
Answer directly, right? It's like your wife asked you, men, husband, do you love me? And the husband says, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't be here. Right? That's a typical, the way men answer. Right? What kind of an answer is that? So, Pilate then started to question Jesus. Because they mentioned three different main accusations were brought before Pilate. Now, look, the chief priests were so shrewd. If they had told Pilate his crime was blasphemy, Pilate wouldn't care because he's a Roman. He doesn't believe in the Jewish God. He has his own gods. So he said blasphemy, he would just laugh at them. They knew that very well. So they twist, they change the whole scene. And what they say is, this man, three different kind of things. This man was inciting people and telling them not to pay tribute to Caesar. That is one. The other one, he says, um, they were, he is creating riots. Okay? He's inciting people against the authorities. And the third one, he claims to be the Messiah, king. That word king was very important. The moment he put, Pilate heard king, then it got his attention. Because king means there is somebody else besides the emperor. Somebody is trying to undermine the authority of uh, Caesar. So he brought him in and he started to question him. Pilate asked him, what did he ask him? Come on, some things he should remember. Are you a king? And Jesus said, you say I am, which means I am a king. However, he qualified. For this I was born. For this I was sent to witness to the truth. And those who are of the truth, listen to me. So Pilate said, what is truth? What is truth? See, Pilate, as a Roman, he would have studied a lot of Greek philosophers. And Greek philosophers and all the philosophers at the time were really in search of truth. They were studying and there was no answer. Everybody had pretty much settled that there is no objective truth. Okay? So he looks and he thinks, you... A simple preacher from Galilee, supposedly a carpenter, great philosophers have given up on the quest for objective truth. You claim to know the truth. So he basically had contempt for Jesus. He laughed, laughed it. He didn't have any patience. And he moved on and came and said, I don't find anything wrong with this man. Of course, the crowds were outraged because... They wanted to see somehow Jesus crucified. So again, they started to accuse him, saying, this man is creating riots, starting from Galilee all the way down here. So Pilate now, he doesn't want to charge Jesus because he knows within his conscience that he is innocent. He also knows that somehow these high priests and these Jewish elders are up to no good. So he doesn't want to play into their hands. They just want to dump all the responsibility on Pilate. So when he sees, hears Galilee, he remembers, oh, Galilee is under Herod's jurisdiction. Let me send him here. So poor Jesus, they drag him now to Herod's palace, which is where? Number six. Do you know who this Herod was? That's another point of confusion. We get confused with all the different Herods. Which Herod was this? Was this the Herod who wanted to kill Jesus when he was a little baby? Or was this a different Herod? Okay, this was, that Herod was his father. This was the son of the Herod the Great who wanted to kill uh, Jesus when he was a baby. He was his son. This was the Herod who had killed John the Baptist. Why? Because he was, you know, he had divorced his wife and married his brother's wife. And the brother's wife and then the, her daughter, Herodias, remember, she had danced for him and he was entertained and he was willing to give half of his 
half of his kingdom to her. So he was this kind of very worldly, sensuous kind of a person, okay? He, liked, he was interested in religion, but he, was also, he had all of his vices as well. So he always wanted to meet Jesus, not because he wanted to know the truth or receive salvation. He just was curious. He had heard about all his miracles. So when they, he found out that Jesus was brought into his palace, he was very curious. For him, Jesus was like a magician. So he was saying, oh, so you're the Jesus of Nazareth. Do a miracle. Do something for me. Okay? And uh, he hoped he would just do some signs, maybe bring something from heaven down, and he'd be entertained. You know, he could drink his wine and eat his grapes, you know, like they show in these old movies. That's what he was hoping to do. But Jesus was not going to entertain. Remember what Jesus had called him? A fox. A fox. Not because he was wise, but he was violent and vicious. And, and he had, remember, murdered John the Baptist. And Jesus would call him, no man was greater, or ever will be greater than John the Baptist. And this man had killed him. So Jesus was not going to respond to him. He remained quiet, said nothing. Herod got tired. There's something I want to say about something we can learn about Jesus is being quiet. You know when uh, that soldier struck him at Annas' house? Now it's coming into place. Now when I say Annas' house, you'll go over there in the first place that he went. Jesus had the power with one word to set this guy on fire and send him like a rocket out into eternity. If he wanted, just one word would have been enough. But he restrained his power. Because remember what Isaiah prophesies in, in uh, uh, Isaiah 53. He would be wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. So he'd, his suffering had begun. And he was not going to do anything. He was not going to use his divine powers for himself. All his divine powers throughout Jesus' ministry was used for other people, not for himself. He could think what he could have done to Herod. He could have just, he, just one word, and Herod would have been just charcoal. That is the kind of power Jesus had. He always had that power. He showed his power through the miracles, but one time only, he showed his power, his glory to his three disciples. Remember where? On the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples saw his real glory. Just think about that glory. It was as bright as the sun. All of that within himself, but contained, constrained, always being humble. Always being humble. Though he was God, what do we do? Little power, and we say, I will show you, right? That's what we do. Do you know who I am? And if I'm not important, I will say, do you know whose son I am? Or do you know who my grandfather was? Jesus didn't use any of that. He constrained his power because he was the suffering servant. Another important point, the chief priest. Okay, let's, let's come to Pilate. What was Pilate's problem? Pilate could not make up his mind. Pilate was a good man. Actually, do you know that there some Orthodox churches celebrate the feast, they consider Pilate and his wife saints. And, and there are letters even that apparently there was a conversion. Pilate converted after because he had a soft heart. And eventually after the crucifixion and all the signs he saw, he became a believer. That's what um, even the early theologians believe that. And I, I have a feeling, yeah, that could be possibly true. Because he was a good man. The problem was he was protecting his self-interest. Isn't that like us? 
No, we are we're very protective of our self-interest. We're more protective about what we have and what we, uh, rather than standing up for Jesus. So Pilate, you know, it's easy to point to him saying, you know, that guy, he couldn't make up, you know, he's wishy-washy. But we're the same. When it comes for standing up for Christ, we are also wishy-washy. We'd rather put that responsibility on someone else, even in our ministry. If someone comes and says, can you pray, brother, I'm sick, I, you know, I'd rather send him to some other anointed person, right? And we send the poor guy from here to here, Anas to Kaifas, Kaifas to somebody else. Because we, we don't want to take that responsibility. So that is one lesson. The other lesson we learn is acting against our conscience. Though our conscience is telling us what the truth is, we do something else. Something that is not what is being prompted. Pilate had an opportunity to be witnessed by Jesus. Do you remember uh, Nicodemus? Nicodemus. This is the man. He was also from the Sanhedrin. And he came at night because he was curious about Jesus' teaching. And he believed that he was a man of God. And he came at night and Jesus told him about the Holy Spirit. He said the Spirit moves out. And he told him one important thing. Unless you're born again. Do you remember that story? Unless you're born again. And Nicodemus was very curious. How am I to be born again? Do I go into my mother's womb? And Jesus spoke to him. And Nicodemus, I believe was converted because of that word. Just think if Pilate would give Jesus a little bit of chance, two minutes, those crowds could have been shouting over there. Let them shout, you know. In the meantime, he could have called his wife, honey, come over here. Let's listen uh, to what Jesus has to hear. I'm sure Jesus could have touched his life. Pilate says, what is truth? When truth was standing right in front of him. Jesus was the truth. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus' word is truth. All the books written in the whole world couldn't contain it. But Pilate didn't have time. Even the chief priest, though they knew about the miracles that Jesus was performing, did you notice that none of those witnesses were there. What about their testimonies? How come they brought false witnesses but did not bring real witnesses? Why didn't they bring the blind man and the lame man and the paralyzed man? Because they would give witness to the truth and they did not want to know the truth. So the chief priests and the high priests were very instrumental in Jesus' death. But God's wisdom is so that everything was fulfilled perfectly. Even though they were wicked in their intention to put our Lord to death, God's plan was being unfolded perfectly. Because remember in the Old Testament, Jesus was the Lamb who was going to be slain for our sins. And what had to happen? Who would slay the Lamb in the Old Testament? A high priest. A priest would do that. The sacrifice was done by the priest. And in fact, some of the blood of that animal was sprinkled on the people, their sins. And when Pilate said, you know, I don't find anything wrong with him. You take him and do whatever you want. And he washed his hands off. What did they say? Let his, let his blood be upon us and our children. There too. The prophecy is fulfilled. You see how beautifully God works, even through wicked people. You remember the story of Joseph? When Joseph was thrown in the well and he was sold to the slaves and God raised him and finally his brothers came. And what did Joseph say? He forgave them and Joseph said to them, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. This is the new Joseph. What you meant for evil, you high priest. What you meant for evil, God was going to use for good. So they were the high priests who were going to be slaughtering the lamb. Now, again, about this rush trial has meaning. Remember the Passover. During the Passover, 
all of the children of Israel had to kill a lamb and they had, with some bitter herbs and they had to eat it with unleavened bread. Leaven is basically yeast. Why did the bread have to be unleavened? Because everything had to happen. There was no time. They had to run. So there was no time for the bread to rise. Here too, the Lamb of God was here. The bread of life was here. And they were rushing his trial. And that bread was going to be unleavened because everything is rushed. And he was going to be taken. And there, on the oven of Calvary, that bread would be baked. And eventually, though there was no leaven in that bread, on the third day, that bread of life would rise and give the bread of life to feed all of us, the new church, the new Israel. So now, Pilate is here, and he finds no fault in him. But they insist, if you don't accuse him, if you don't charge him, you're not a friend of Caesar. And then he they brought up all these riots. And so um, Pilate, one of his biggest concerns was he didn't want trouble. No trouble. Because if there was any trouble, the emperor was going to find out, and he would have to send additional soldiers. And they didn't want that additional expense. And he was in trouble. So he, didn't want, he wanted peace at all costs. Sometimes we want peace at all costs, don't we? doesn't matter if you compromise God and his principle. Just give us peace. We're willing to compromise with the devil also. When we sin, what do we do? When we sin, we do the same thing that Pilate did. We make a compromise. We make a deal with Satan. And we go for that sin, for that pleasure, and for that comfort. So Pilate was at this point, he just wanted to get it over with quickly. He didn't want any trouble. But he didn't want the guilt either. So he washes off his hands. Kind of a false confession, isn't it? You cannot get rid of sin by washing hands. How do we get of sin, rid of sin today? It has to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And that he didn't have because he didn't recognize the Lamb of God standing in front of him. So he gave him over to, uh, to the crowds who shouted and screamed. By the way, something about the crowds we need to know also. On Sunday, they were saying, Hosanna! Like on Wednesdays, how we say, Hallelujah! On Friday, they were saying, Crucify Him! This is how fickle crowds are. This is how fickle we are. On Wednesdays, we say, Hallelujah! Some trouble comes on Friday, and what do we say? Who cares about God? We don't want God. Next Wednesday, I'm not going to the prayer meeting, right? But it is also something for those of us who are in ministry to know about crowds. Don't get attached to crowds. Don't get carried away by their compliments. Because crowds are very fickle. On Wednesday, they will praise you. On Friday, when they find out there's something wrong with you, or you've done something wrong, they'll want to crucify you. So don't get attached to the crowds. Don't get addicted to their compliments. It's good to be encouraged. It's good to be encouraged. It's good to receive the encouragement. But don't get attached to it. Jesus never got attached to it. That's why he was not disappointed. He knew that's what they would be saying. That's why when they said Hosanna, he was not riding on that, those Hosannas. He was riding on a humble donkey. Because he knew what was coming. So that's to you. That's the crowds. So now, Pilate is in a bind. What is he going to do? So he finds a way out. He says, by the way, it is a custom during Passover to release a prisoner. And they had a prisoner ready. His name was Barabbas. You know what Barabbas means? Do you know what Barabbas' first name was? Anyone? Jesus was his first name. So in front of Pilate, there are two Jesuses. Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus Barabbas. Do you know what Barabbas means? 
Bar means sun. Actually, in Hebrew, it's Baraba. Son of the Father. Who was Jesus? Son of the Father. Another Jesus? Son of the Father. But the question is, which father? Barabbas was the son of a different father because he was a criminal. See, every charge that the Jewish leadership brought against Jesus, Barabbas was guilty of. But they were taking the sins of Barabbas and putting them on Jesus. Does Barabbas represent us? Are we Barabbas? Are our sins... So when the crowd said, free Barabbas and crucify Jesus, it was in our interest. Because if Barabbas was not free, Jesus would not be crucified and we would not be saved. So we have to thank Barabbas, that ugly guy. I cannot tell you all the things that he had done and what he was. And how these, there were zealots during those days who wanted to take the Roman Empire, wanted to attack, you know, just like how you have rebels today in Syria and all of that. They were fighting uh, and they, want, they, they were violent against the Romans. So everything Jesus was accused of, Barabbas did. So Barabbas' sins were taken by Jesus. And if he represents us and the Barabbas in us, Jesus took our sins too. We're, I just want to summarize. What is it that we learn from today? First and foremost, we learn how Jesus was maltreated, terribly treated, taken from place to place. If you've ever been involved in police and courts, I have in my past life, it's a terrible thing. The moment you're charged of anything, you lose your human dignity. You're not a human being anymore. You're just a number. And they can do anything they want to you. Anything they want. The soldiers can mistreat you. Even the prisoners can uh, hurt you. It doesn't matter. Because you lose your rights. Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, was treated in an inhuman way almost like an animal. In fact, the prophecies say so. Even Isaiah says that he did not look like a human being. At least, you know, when we see pictures of the crucifix and Jesus crucified, the carpenters do such a good job of making him look nice and they show his six packs and, you know, that's, that's not anything close to what Jesus looked like. He did not look like a human being. That was his state by the end of all the flogging, all the beating and the spitting and everybody, the, the chief priest spit on him as well. By the way, Jesus was a high priest as well. But not according, you know, when uh, that it's really symbolic that when Caiaphas tore his clothes, he was basically ending the uh, priesthood of, the, of Aaron, the, the, the priesthood of flesh. And bringing in the new priesthood of Jesus, who was a priest not according to Aaron, but according to Melchizedek, who we encounter in the book of Genesis. And he was a priest of the Most High. He was a divine priest. And Jesus was an everlasting priest. Though, so the limited earthly priesthood was ending as um, Caiaphas tore his robes and the new priesthood, everlasting priesthood was beginning. And Jesus is today the prophet, the priest and king. And that title has been given to each one of us in baptism. That is what we are. Jesus died so we could receive those great honorable titles. Though we are sinners, we are prophets, we are priests, we are kings. And we are called to give witness to Christ don't be like the chief priest, wicked to recognize him. Don't be jealous of others who might be slightly better than you. Their main problem was jealousy. This is the problem for those of us in ministry. We should be very careful. Priests and preachers and prayer group leaders, those who have a professional connection to religion have to be very scared because we can become really controlled. We start to put a brand on Jesus, you know? This is mine, you know? This is now HSI. 
This Jesus is HSI's Jesus. Any other type comes? No, no, no. You understand? We cannot put a brand on Jesus. Jesus belongs to everyone. He's a universal God, God of the universe, not just even of Christians. He died for all humanity, not just for Christians, Protestants, or Catholics. This is what the chief priests were doing. They had their notion of who God was and what their Messiah would look like. So they missed the Messiah when he came in front of them. It could happen to us. We will miss the Jesus if we have a certain picture. We think when Jesus will walk, he'll have a HSI t-shirt. No. Or ABC prayer group. Or charismatic renewal. No. He is simply Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who took, takes the sin. We have our different communities. They're fine to have communities. But we cannot become jealous when somebody comes with a different innovative idea. Or someone is a little more anointed, has a little more gifts. We should not become jealous. If we are, then we become like those Pharisees. We become like those priests who were jealous of Jesus. The main reason they killed him is they were jealous. They wanted to continue that powerful positions that they had. So therefore, they missed the salvation. He came to his own, and his own knew him not. We are his own. He dearly loves us, but we could miss him if we take the focus away from him and focus on anything else. Can we take the final song? We're now going to, uh, we're going to worship Jesus once again. And in your mind, as we sing this song, I want you to place yourself with Jesus, walking through his ordeal, accompanying him, whichever is your favorite place. If Caiaphas is your favorite place, you be there. If Pilate is your favorite place, be there among the crowds. Or you can take roles, you know, maybe you can be Pilate's wife, you know, where you've had this nightmare and you've heard, don't do anything uh, uh, against that innocent man, that righteous man. You better not get involved or wherever you want to be. But Jesus is there. Let him know, Lord, I know you are so alone. You healed so many people. You delivered so many people. Where was Lazarus, by the way? You know, I was, as I was studying and preparing, I was like, where's Lazarus? The man was raised from the dead. Why wasn't he ready to take his place? We don't know. They all abandoned him, including his disciples. One even ran away nude without his clothes. That's how desperate some people are to get away from Jesus. Take, keep my clothes also. But just let me save my life. It's easy to say hallelujah, hallelujah. But when the trial comes, we'll give our undergarments also to those people who are coming to persecute us and run. But for the grace of God. To be faithful to Christ, we need Jesus' grace. We need the Holy Spirit. So let us worship him. Let us say, Lord, help us to not be like these people who were traitors, you know, who hurt you, who hit you, who spat on you who put false witnesses and accuse you falsely. Help us to stand up for you. Help us to love you. Help us to receive your salvation, your good news. Can we stand as we do that?
Let us worship him. At the foot of the cross. Let us tell him how much we love him. Acknowledge him as a son of the living God and the master of our lives. You have given me life through the death you bore for me. Jesus, come. Come and bless us, Jesus. Come and bless us, Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Wash us with your precious blood. Your precious and holy blood that you shed for us. Let this Lenten season be special, Lord. Let it not be a routine. We want to experience your love and your mercy. I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross. Free us from all the burdens, Lord. And with forgiveness like a crown. Coming to kiss the feet of Thank you, Jesus, for your cross. Thank you, Jesus, for Calvary. Thank you, Jesus, that we come, that we can come to the foot of the cross and lay all of our burdens down. Thank you that by your bruises, by your stripes, we are healed. Every beating that you took every crack of the whip, every slap, every blow, every buffeting you took for us. It was not Barabbas, Lord. It was not Pilate. It was not even the chief priests. It wasn't even the Jews. It was my sin that really killed you. My selfishness, my jealousy, my pride. I lay these at the foot of the cross and ask you to forgive me. I ask you to embrace me. I ask you to fill me with your spirit that I can carry the message of resurrection to those who yearn for it and be a true witness to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And glory to you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to you, Jesus.